Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Dr. Lori Santos, who is a professor of psychology and head of Silliman College at Yale University. Dr. Santos is an expert on human cognition and the cognitive biases that impede better choices. Her course, The Psychology and the Good Life, teaches students what the science of psychology says about how to make wiser choices and live a life that's happier and more fulfilling. The class is Yale's most popular course in over 300 years and has been adapted into a free Coursera program that has been taken by over 3.9 million people to date. Dr. Santos has been featured in numerous news outlets, including the New York Times, NBC Nightly News, The Today Show, CBS This Morning, NPR, GQ Magazine, and much more. Dr. Santos is a winner of numerous awards, both for her science and teaching from institutions such as Yale and the American Psychological Association. She has been featured as one of Popular Science's brilliant 10 young minds and was named Time's leading campus celebrity. Her podcast, The Happiness Lab, which launched in 2019, has over 72 million downloads. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Dr. Lori Santos to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Dr. Lori Santos, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm so, so happy to have you here because there's so much to talk about with you and you're like one of the world's leading experts on the psychology of happiness. And something that I've often always wondered is like, do you think that based on your teachings, based on the course you teach at Yale, like, do you think that that happiness is a choice or do you think that some people are just born happier than others? I think kind of the evidence suggests both in some sense, right? So if you look at the heritability of happiness, so this is like how much of the variance in the population in terms of people's happiness is explained by people's genes, what you find is that happiness is heritable. In other words, you know, if you come from a long line of super happy people, if your mom was happy and grandma was happy, great grandma was happy, you're probably statistically more likely to be happy. That said, the heritability is much smaller than you'd think, right? It's, it's less heritable, that, for example, than somebody's height or somebody's weight. And what that means is that there's a lot of room to like take your own action to improve your happiness. So so it's not the case that there's nothing about your level of well-being or your level of mental health that's not built in, but much of it, if, if not most of it, is really built based on your own actions, based on your own behaviors and mindsets. So that's really good news, right? Like happiness didn't have to work that way where we have a lot of control over it, but the evidence suggests that we actually can affect our happiness a lot more than we often assume. Right. Because I've often also wondered, you know, based on that, like take like mental illness out of the equation. But, you know, we all know the people that no matter what, nothing makes them happy and they're just flat out miserable all the time. And with with your research and everything that you've come across in your years of doing this, like what are some of the things that these people might be missing in their lives that could like elevate their level of happiness? Yeah, well, we know there's lots of simple behaviors and mindsets that that can really improve your well-being if you intentionally choose to engage with those behaviors or to take on those mindsets, right? On the mindset side, you know, one of the biggest ones is a mindset of gratitude, right? You know, we, we this kind of feels like grandmotherly advice, right? Like, you know, count your blessings, you know, pay attention to the good things in life. But if you look at the people who statistically self-report the highest levels of happiness, they're experiencing gratitude a lot more. They're expressing gratitude to the other people around them, right? And that's a choice, right? We could choose to focus on all the hassles or we could choose to focus on all the blessings in life. Happy people also tend to have really specific behaviors. They tend to be much more social. Pretty much every available study of happy people suggests that happy people are just physically around other people more often. And they also tend to prioritize like specific people, namely the people that they care about in life, their friends and their family members. They also tend to do more nice stuff for other people. You know, if you look at people's happiness levels controlled for income, happier people tend to donate more money to charity and controlled for their amount of free time, happier people tend to volunteer more often than not so happy people. So just kind of engaging with other people, becoming a little bit more other oriented, you know, as a way that you can feel happier. And then there's a host of just like really simple, straightforward things like, you know, exercise, like getting enough sleep, right? Like just like the normal stuff of life, these healthy habits, they actually matter a lot for our our overall happiness and mental health. So there's lots of things that you can enter if you're not feeling happy or if you know someone that's not feeling happy, you're, you're not stuck there. There's lots of things that you can change to feel better. Right. And that's that's really good news because you'll hear a lot of people like they'll say, well, I'm just in a funk right now. I just don't have the energy or I just feel off. And 
it's like they don't want to do the very things that they they know like in the back of their their head is what's going to drive them like up that that happiness scale and the other thing like i guess on on top of that to add another layer to like what we were just talking about is that i think people have this idea that if they're not happy all the time with their lives that that means that their life is just completely unsuccessful so like what is your what is your like, opinion on that? Should people be this co- have this constant state of happiness? And then how do they deal with the ups and downs? Or maybe there's days where they aren't as happy. Yeah, I think this is a really common misconception that I think can be summed up as like toxic positivity, right? This idea that like you have to be happy all the time. Like if you have moments of sadness or anxiety, like, oh, something's terribly wrong, right? You need to completely change your life. But this is wrong, right? Like negative emotions are useful evolutionary tools. They're there for a reason. They're not just there to make us feel like crap. Like they're there as a signal that like, hey, something's wrong or hey, that there's something you need to attend to in your life. And I think it's worth remembering that negative emotions can be normative. Like, you are supposed to feel negative emotions in certain kinds of situations. And, you know, to be fair, a lot of those situations are ones that we're experiencing, like right now, like you and I are talking as people are coming out of like two and a half year pandemic, right? There's political polarization, like the climate's all messed up, right? Like, you know, there's like structures of racism and all kinds of bad stuff happening. Like, it's normative to feel pissed about all that stuff. It's normative to feel sad about all that stuff. It's normative to feel anxious and uncertain about some of the situations we face. And like, that's okay. Like you wouldn't be human if you weren't feeling that. The key though, is that we need ways and strategies to allow those emotions without them, you know, taking us over or kind of destroying our lives or getting stuck in them. And I think that's, that's the problem. The bigger issue is that our instinct when we experience these negative emotions is like, they're bad. So squash them down. The analogy I use with my Yale students is it's like, you know, taking a beach ball and trying to like stuff it underwater. That's what you're doing when you're trying to like stuff your negative emotions down. And if you've ever seen a kid trying to do this, of course, you're like holding on to the beach ball in all these terrible ways. And eventually it's going to like fly out and like hit somebody in the face. And I think that's what happens when we try to squash down our sadness or our anger, right? It's not going away. It's going to come back and hit you or somebody else in a not so pleasant way. And so I think we do need to recognize that these emotions emotions are normal, they're necessary, and probably really helpful in a certain sense, but we need to navigate them and deal with them effectively. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's very normal to feel sad when when things aren't going well. I think it's very normal, like you said, to feel like angry or fearful based on what's transpired over the last several years. And it's interesting is that like for me, I'm, I've been in recovery for, for almost 14 years. And I thought that I was always like on this pursuit of happiness, like to be happy with my life no matter what. But I did it in like the wrong way possible by using like drugs to to numb that, to make me feel good about myself. And then of course, on the back end of that, that led to much despair, which is the total opposite of what I wanted in the first place, right? And so with, with that said, like I know that in life, like we definitely should be like wanting to to live a, a happy and meaningful life most of the time. But I think a lot of people have a lot of people become challenged with this when so much of it is based on things that are outside of themselves and outside of their control. So what strategies do you teach your students so that they can focus on the things that are in front of them and not pay attention so much to the things that are outside of their control? Yeah, I mean, I think one is is just first the recognition that there are just things that you can't control. And in some ways, that's okay, right? The, the key is that you have to focus on the stuff that you can control. And the things you can always control are your behaviors and your mindsets and, and your attitudes, right? One of the sort of stories I tell my students about this comes from the Buddhist tradition. You know, all, all the work I talk about is really evidence-based and scientific. But if you look to the ancient traditions, oftentimes, like, they got it right. You know, they're kind of mirroring what the science says. And there's this one very famous Buddhist parable of the second arrow. And so it goes something like this Buddha's asking his followers, like, hey, if you're walking down the street followers and you get hit by an arrow is that bad you know would that cause negative emotion and buddha's followers are like yeah you know sucks to get hit by an arrow like out of nowhere buddha says okay you imagine if you're walking down the street and you don't just get hit by one arrow you also get hit by a second arrow on top of that is that worse and his followers say yeah like you know that's even worse to get hit by two arrows instead of one and so buddha goes on to say you know the first arrow it's all the stuff you can't control, right? It's like, you know, life's going badly, you know, like things come up, like you get sick, like, you know, bad stuff at work. Like you can't control that. That's the first arrow. But the second arrow is our reaction to that. 
That's if we, you know, face those bad things and, you know, drink too much or yell at our spouse or, you know, take on all these bad things or just like, like sit in those emotions without doing anything good for ourselves for weeks and weeks at a time. And Buddha goes on to note that the second arrow is often worse and it's under our control. It's always up to us. So we can't control the first arrow. We can't control those circumstances. That's out of our control, but we always can control how we react to them. And and that's really, I think the path of a lot of this work in the science of well-being is like, what strategy? can you use to control that, that that are effective, healthy strategies, right? I mean, in some ways, you know, reaching for a glass of scotch is, is a way to control those emotions, but it's not ultimately a very healthy one. The good news is that there are lots of healthy ways we can engage with controlling how we react to things that do feel good for us that ultimately don't end in the kind of despair you were talking about. Right. And a lot of the things that are out of our control in many cases are... They're, they're forms of external validation that we think are going to lead to happiness. I mean, how many times do you hear, I mean, I've said this to myself, like when I make this amount of money, I'll be happy. Or when I get this relationship, I'll be happy. Or I can go on and on with examples. And I think there's certain people that are listening to this that are thinking that right now, like I just need to get ahead a little bit more. Or I just need to finally find that person who treats me right. So if you could maybe summarize to the best of your ability, like why that it's just not true. What people can do instead when they're feeling that way, I think people would really see a lot of value in that. Yeah. I mean, this actually is is such a like real thing that people go through that social scientists have a word for this. They call it the arrival fallacy. It's kind of like the, hap- the happily ever after fallacy. Like I'll be happy when I get the relationship or I'll be happy when I make a certain amount of money. So many of us think this, but all the evidence suggests that it's just not the case. There's a lot of evidence that we are bad at what's called affective forecasting, right? Predicting how we're going to feel after we reach some interesting accomplishment or whether some good thing happens in our life. And one of the ways we affectively forecast forecast badly is that we often think that when we reach some good milestone in our lives, we'll be happily ever after, right? We'll be really happy and for a long time. And what we find is that if you look at people who actually have those wonderful things happen, you know, it's not that they're miserable. They they are a little happy, but it's not as happy as we predict. So the magnitude of happiness isn't what we expect. And also the duration that we experience that happiness isn't as long as we expect. You know, you get a little blip of happiness, but like, that's it. You just go back to baseline. And we know this from all kinds of studies. You can look at, for example, lottery winners. You know, people play the lottery because they predict if I, you know, made a million dollars or a billion dollars, I'd be super happy. But you look at lottery winners and yeah, on the day you win the lottery, that's awesome. Like you're a happy person like that Tuesday that you hit Powerball. But if you come back to those same people six months later, one year later, what you find is that their happiness hasn't changed. And that's true for people who get married, you know, the day you get married, you know, the moment you meet the love of your life, that's awesome. But again, if you look back six months later, a year later, people kind of just go back to baseline. This is what's called hedonic adaptation. We adapt to all these hedonic, you know, these good feeling things in life, which kind of is sad, right? It means that like the good circumstances in life don't make us as happy as we think for as long as we think. But hedonic adaptation has a nice flip side, which is like, even the bad things in life don't make us as miserable as we think or for as long as we think. You know, we predict, oh, if I take a risk and, you know, ask this person out and, you know, he or she says no, or if we apply for a job and don't get it, you know, we'll be so bummed out, we'll be miserable. We predict we'll be, you know, really miserable and for a long time. But in practice, we affectively forecast badly about the the not so good things in life too. We're not going to be as upset and we're not going to be as upset for as long as we think. And that means we're not taking all the the kinds of risks in life. You know, we're not kind of pushing ourselves in ways that we could be pushing ourselves without the negative consequences we expect. Right, right. Yeah, that's all so true. And thank you for like explaining it in that way, because you're right. Like, I mean, there's something you said a few minutes ago, just really hit home where it's like, we think that when we get to that that level of success or that level of meaning in our life, that it's going to be super sweet. And it's normally not as sweet as you think it's going to be, or it doesn't last as long as you think it will. And I mean, there's been, there's been a couple of times where I've bought and like something new and I'm like, yeah, I really want this. It's gonna, this is going to make me happy for the next, like, I don't know, three years or whatever. And then I buy it. And then three days later, I can't find it. So I, I mean, and I think there's a lot of people that are listening to this <laughs> that have probably gone through something similar while on this like the kind of like in, on this theme of like what really drives happiness i know in your upcoming mini series you're going to talk about like almost like do we have the ability to like manipulate other people's levels of happiness like can we make people around us happier and 
like what I wanted to, to ask about this in particular is you hear a lot that you are like the five people you surround yourself with. And is there science to back that up? Meaning like if you're spending time with four or five people who are generally optimistic about where they're going in life, are you going to be able to pick up that energy or is that just, you know, Pollyanna and false? Yeah, no, this is something that there's a ton of scientific evidence for. You know, researchers call it emotional contagion. You know, we think about contagion with, you know, viruses and COVID and things like that. But emotions are just as contagious, if not more contagious than COVID, you know, and we kind of get that implicitly, right? You know, if you walk into some work team meeting, and everybody's upbeat and on top of things, even if you came in kind of feeling a little down, you're going to catch that. And what's what we're even more susceptible to is the opposite. If you come in upbeat and you walk into a team and everybody's like, oh, no, this is going to be terrible, blah, 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 you immediately catch that. So the people we surround ourselves with do really affect us. They do really affect our emotions. And this includes online, right? You know, if you plop into a social media feed and everybody's complaining about stuff or feeling anxious about things, you're going to catch that. And in fact, there's evidence suggesting that it'll affect your posts, right? If you read a feed that has a lot of anxiety provoking stuff, you're going to post more anxiety provoking stuff, even if you weren't thinking that. And I love that result because it shows kind of what happens in these moments of emotional contagion, that we get what, what are often called affective spirals, right? You know, you walk into the team meeting and, you know, there's a bunch of people who are down, you start feeling down, but then you walk into a different meeting feeling down and that affects the other people. Or you walk, you, you enter your house and you go home and you see your spouse and your kids and you're feeling like in a bad mood and then they get in a bad mood. So you can get these spirals that like get worse and worse over time. But you can also get these spirals that go better and better over time too. And I think the key to remember in emotional contagion is that we're not just like the the hapless victims of it where we're just like, oh, everybody affects us. You know, we can be the agent of change that we want to see, right? And and that means that if you really put work into intentionally taking care of your own well-being, intentionally changing your own mindset to one of gratitude and optimism, again, which we can totally do, you don't just affect yourself, you affect other people. And that can be good because affecting other people can come back and help you, you know, when you need it, right? When you walk into that team meeting and you seed a little bit of optimism, you know, a week later, your teammates might come back and, and give you the optimism back because they've kind of caught it. We can turn on these sort of positive affective spirals. And and that's pretty exciting because it, you know, it means that when we affect our own well-being, we don't just affect ourselves. We might be affecting the people we care about around ourselves too. I'm so glad you said that because uh, people would have probably called me a liar if you said it wasn't true because over the last <laughs> like de decade or so or whatever, like you know, since I've really gotten into the personal development stuff, like I've been saying that the people you spend time with like matters. Like you got to surround yourself with people who bring the best out on you. And if you had said, nah, it doesn't matter, then I just would have kind of looked like a, <laughs> I got a little bit of a fraud, well, I guess. No. Well, the key there is that you matter too, right? right. I mean, I think this is, this is what we, it's funny. Um, you know, there was, you know, these studies about how happiness transmits in social networks. And when these studies were covered in Europe, uh, when these studies were covered in America, the, the headline kind of worked like you were saying, like, your friends affect you, like your friends are miserable, they're making you miserable. When you look at how the same studies were covered in Europe, it was the opposite. It was like, are your friends miserable? Could be your fault. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so it's like, we have to remember that this is like a, a two way street, right? And and I think that can be important. It, sometimes it's hard to, to have the permission to focus on our own well being, right? It can feel frivolous, or it can feel really the kind of thing that feels really selfish. But but when you remember that that you're part of this interaction, then it can kind of give you maybe the extra oomph you need to to invest in yourself and invest in your own happiness. Right, right. I mean, yeah, you're right. It's it's a two way street, and it's hard to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you know, sometimes we're the common denominator in all of this, and it's super easy to blame other people for your for your level of happiness. Um, the last thing I want to touch on, like when it comes to this part of what you talk about is I think a lot of people have a hard time when somebody comes to them and they're like having a bad day or they're going through something challenging and they're trying their best to, to listen, but they're also trying their best, especially if it's a loved one, to help them feel better. Is it possible? Like, Is, there, is it something that to do with somebody's energy? Is there something you can say to somebody to help somebody who's really feeling like sad during a time in their life to help them like feel a bit happier? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to do is first just to remember that being there for them and listening is is a lot of the work right like by sitting there and listening you might not you know transform someone's depression you know especially if they're in a really bad mental health state right like you might not be able to fix that but 
the fact that you're there to listen is doing the work. It is actually helping even if you kind of can't see it. And so I think this gets back to something we chatted about before, which is like, what can you control and what you can't control, right? Like you can control how much you show up for other people. You can control how much you're there for other people. And that matters, even if it doesn't, you know, immediately have the effect you expect. I think, you know, it's hard for us to remember that baby steps are the way behavior change and emotion change works, right? We think like, oh, I'll go listen to my friend's problems. And instantly that friend won't be depressed anymore. But like, that's just like not how brains work, right? But the The baby step that you take of sitting there to listen, being there for your friend, you know, maybe slightly even improving their mood a little bit, like that matters. And it's going to launch a cascade that will have real effects. But, But I think we need to be patient with ourselves and self-compassionate with ourselves about, you know, how much we can really impact other people. And often the impact is really just the listening part, you know, that that does a lot of the work. Right. A common theme of our conversation so far has been this notion of like choice and personal responsibility and that you can, you have the ability to control what's in front of you and you can make choices that can improve your level of happiness. And we also talked about towards the beginning that a lot of times people's levels of happiness is based on genetics. And and with all that say, with all that said to bring it all together, does somebody have the ability to change like their DNA? Let's just say they implement some of the things you've been talking about and then within within their family they do do the same thing and then they all become happier. Well then their kids have like higher levels of happiness based on their genetics. Yeah, I mean, you know, to my knowledge, we're not when we're taking these intentional actions, we're mostly not changing our genetic code. Our genetic code is going to be there. But I think, you know, especially when you're doing these kinds of practices with your kids, you're changing the environment and the habits that they have really early on. You know, this is one of the reasons I teach happiness to college students. And and one of my projects for this next year, I'm taking this year off from my responsibilities at Yale to develop new curricula for even younger kids, like trying to teach happiness to like three to six year olds, right? In part, because I think if you learn these strategies over time, and if you're a parent, you model these strategies for your kids, in some ways, you don't need to change their DNA because you're so changing their habits and their environment that like the DNA is not going to matter. I think what what we know from the heritability work is that the DNA just kind of predisposes us to stuff. It might predispose you to like being social, but like you can intentionally just choose to be social. You know, your DNA might predispose you to maybe experience gratitude more naturally. But like, again, you don't need your DNA. You could just, you know, force yourself to intentionally think a little bit more gratefully. And as you form these habits, it becomes easier and easier over time. And the earlier you form these habits, the better it is. So I wouldn't worry too much about changing DNA, which is always tricky. You know, it's embedded in the cells of our body and (laughs) blah, blah, blah. But if you change the habits, that's actually going to do more of the work anyway. Right, right. Yeah. So it's good to know. And with some of the habits that we talked about earlier, we talked about like gratitude and how important that is. And um, I was just curious to see like what your personal gratitude practice is like. And then on the second half of that question is, is there science to back up like specific like modalities of a gratitude practice? Meaning like, can it be as simple as just writing something down on a piece of paper or do you actually have to go out and do that action? Yeah. I mean, on the modality side, you know, the, the evidence is like, as long as you feel the gratitude, it's going to work. I guess the things you want from a modality side are you want to be able to feel the gratitude. So you don't want it to be rote, you know, like if you have a gratitude list and every day you're like, my husband, my job, my family, you know, like, and you write that, those three things every day, you might stop feeling it over time, right? You really want to take a moment to experience that sense of like, wow, you know, I appreciate what's actually happening here. The second thing is you want a modality that allows you to do it. I think sometimes when we get into these personal change moments, we we set up these modalities that are like infinitely complicated and we're like never going to do it. Like, so you want something that's like really easy, like no barrier to entry, like, you know, super simple though, so that it makes it very easy for you to do every day. And if you want a simple hack, you know, one that I've talked to my students about and that I sometimes use myself is pick some activity that you're going to be doing every day anyway. You know, I think you're like brushing your teeth is a good one, right? And like, instead of just brushing your teeth and, you know, ruminating about what's going on in the day, brush your teeth and think about, you know, what am I grateful for today? You know, what do I really want to savor today? Use that as an intentional practice. And then in the evening, you'll go back and think about, you know, what were the things that were good today? Like, again, you're gonna, if you're going to brush your teeth every day, you know, twice a day, that's just a time that you can reuse for something else. A final thing I'll say about gratitude is that another thing the research suggests is that 
experiencing it privately is great, right? It can kind of change your mindset to one of appreciation. But there's also lots of evidence that expressing gratitude is a good thing to do to improve your happiness, expressing it to the people you're really grateful for. Because often, you know, if I think of my own, you know, moments of teeth brushing gratitude, it's not like the stuff in my life. It's like the people that I'm most grateful for. But we don't often say it. And that's bad because it means that people don't get to hear it. It's nice for the people to hear it. But also it means we're missing out on like a way to kind of do like double time on our gratitude happiness hack, which is that you're also engaging in social connection when you do the gratitude, right? If you express thanks to other people, you have to make a social connection. It's also doing something nice for somebody else because people like it when you express gratitude. And you're liable to feel it more when you're, you know, one-on-one, like thanking somebody and expressing it, right? Like really genuinely. And so, you know, another really great gratitude hack is really, you know, thank people, whether that's sending a thank you letter or a quick text to just be like, hey, you know, I appreciate you. Like those are powerful and simple, you know, take like five minute type hacks that can lead to long-term boosts in happiness. In fact, one study by the positive psychologist, Marty Seligman at Penn suggests that expressing gratitude to other people can actually lead to a small but significant boost and well-being that lasts for over a month, which is like a long time, right? And so, you know, we forget the power of these simple mindset changes and expressions of gratitude, but they can really hack our happiness for long periods of time. Man, that's that's fascinating, and and I'm glad for people to hear this because sometimes people can think that the gratitude like falls in the Pollyanna category, mm-hmm, totally, and they think that people are just saying that and it's you know not going to work. But I think when you you hear it explained, like you just said, like, I think there's, there's obviously science to back it up. And I think it can work. Like if again, you put your mind to it and all your years of studying happiness and even like learning from your students, as you've even learning from your students along the way and with your podcast, like what's been the most like surprising thing that you've learned about this complicated emotion, like throughout your research and work? Yeah. I feel like there's so, so many surprises. I mean, I think the thing that continues to surprise me as I try to practice this stuff myself is just how bad our intuitions are, right? You know, our our intuition that like, oh my gosh, I'm not happy. I'm not perfectly happy. I'm doing something wrong. Like, no, that's just wrong. Or or that arrival fallacy we have. We mentioned this idea of like, oh, I'll just be happily ever after if, right? I mean, I know this work. I can like, like quote the dates of these empirical studies, but I still fall prey to these intuitions, right? You know, I'm like thinking about buying a new phone and I'm like, oh, if I had a new phone, I'd have a good camera and blah, blah, blah. And like, I'm effectively forecasting in ways that I know are incorrect. Like I'm going to get this phone and a week later, it's like, it's just my phone. It's not going to have any of this good stuff. But, but like, I fall prey to this stuff too. And so I think that's the part that fascinates me the most. It's like, you know, our minds just kind of suck when it comes to predicting the sorts of things that'll make us happy. But I think that's one of the reasons the empirical science can really help, right? Is that the science can kind of push us in the right direction. Even when our intuitions are wrong, we can remember like, oh yeah, I heard about that study. You know, maybe I should try something a little different. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you're you're so spot on because I think we're, we all are, are human, right? No matter how much knowledge we have of a certain subject and we all are always working on, we're always working so hard to get better at whatever subject that is that we are the most knowledgeable at. So thank you for like being vulnerable and, and sharing that. I want to go into like something else that you're, you're going to talk about in your upcoming mini series that I think is probably the, the hardest thing I would say for people on the subject of happiness. And that is... Like, how, do, how are you happy when things just suck, <laughs> when your life is falling apart and you feel like it's just one thing after another, no matter what you try, nothing's working and you're just in chaos all the time. And I know we've talked about gratitude. I'm sure that's part of the equation. But other than that, like, what are some of the things that you've learned that can actually help people like feel somewhat optimistic when their life is falling apart? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the first things is like, again, to remember that like not feeling happy when your life is falling apart is normative, right? Like you're not going to experience the most joy when things are going really badly. And that's not only okay, but like that's what's supposed to happen. You know, like when your life is falling apart, it's the emotional equivalent of a physical situation of like putting your hand on a hot stove. You know, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you're going to experience some pain. And that pain is going to cause you to like move your hand away, right? Negative emotions are, are there to to help you go through whatever tough times you're going through. Like sadness is about going through grief, which is a process we need to engage in when sad things happen, when there's trauma or when we need to grieve something. You know, anger is an appropriate response to an unfair situation and one that we might want to correct or get out of. You know, anxiety is signaling there's something uncertain and scary here. You know, I might need to 
fix things or at least just allow that anxiety to be there if I can't control the situation. And so I think one of the ways you deal with these, you know, times that are kind of sucking is to recognize like these are times that are sucking. Like I'm going to recognize the emotions that I'm dealing with and just kind of allow them to be there. One of one of my favorite practices to do this comes from the meditation teacher Tara Brock, and it's a meditation practice that she calls RAIN, which is an acronym for recognize, allow, investigate and nurture. And so it's kind of what you do with your emotions, you know, so you're going through a tough time, sit down for five minutes and do this meditation where you just recognize, okay, what are, what are the emotions here? Right. And it might not be what you think. You may be like, oh, I I thought it was sadness, but I'm really just overwhelmed. Or, you know, I thought I was pissed, but I'm actually just really in mourning. I'm like really grieving something. Right. And then you do the A step, which is allow. You say, all right, if it's grieving, I'm just going to allow that experience in my physical body to be there. I'm not going to fight it. But you give your brain something to do while you're allowing it. And that's the I step, investigate. You say, all right, with interest and care, I'm going to pay attention to what this is like in my body. I'm not going to run away from it or grab a drink or check my email or, you know, do some other thing that I'm craving to do. I'm just going to sit with this and be really curious about what it feels like. And that process works because, you know, the science shows that emotions are like, like a wave. It's often called urge surfing when you sit with some negative emotion or some craving and it, you know, it will go up over time, but, you know, eventually that feeling is going to crest and go away. And that's when you do the last step of rain, which is the end of nurture. You know, negative emotions don't feel good. What can you do to nurture yourself? Again, it sounds like cheesy, but like, hey, take care of yourself. This didn't feel good, right? Can you call a friend or, you know, can you take a break? Maybe cancel some meeting, take something off your plate, right? Do something to sort of take care of yourself. And these practices like rain are powerful. There's evidence, for example, that practices like rain can reduce burnout in, in first responders and even in palliative care workers who are dealing with, you know, really grief stricken situations all the time. So, you know, we can harness these kinds of capacities ourselves to allow negative emotions when they make sense, but not to do the beach ball thing where we're suppressing them and pretending they're not happening, which often makes it worse. Right. Right. Yeah. That all, that all makes sense. And I think that process, I think is going to help a lot of people because I think so many people get tripped up in the shame around feeling these emotions, specifically people who are listening to podcasts like mine and podcasts like yours that are looking to better themselves and, and learn how to deal with life a little bit uh, better and improve like the way they function, where they, they are improving it in some way. And then they hit a roadblock and all of a sudden they feel like anxious. They feel stressed. They feel off. And they're like, why am I feeling this way? Like I thought I was working on myself to not feel like this all the time. And that's true. But what's also true is given what you're going through, it's a a normal emotion to have. And I think, you know, again, we do better when we think about how these things work in our physical body, right? You know, imagine you're training for a 5K or something, but you, you trip and sprain your ankle, right? You can't keep running and training at the 5K in the same way. you got to take a break, right? You know, because the situation has changed. And I think when we think about our happiness and our mental health, we got to do the same thing, right? We often give our ourselves more leeway and more flexibility when it comes to our physical bodies than when it comes to our mental health, but they work often the same way. Right, right. Yeah. Mental health and physical health go hand in hand. I want to talk about money. And we, I guess we all know, I guess it's pretty obvious that money, like money doesn't buy you happiness, right? No amount of money is just going to make you happy all the time. But I'm sure it can help in certain ways. Like, I mean, if you don't have money and you can't put gas in your car, then you can't go out and socialize with your friends. If, if you have more money, you can pay for and have experiences with your kids and your families that they might remember for a lifetime. So like, what's your opinion on money as it relates to happiness? Like, does it play any role of importance or not? Yeah, it kind of depends on how much money you have. Um, You know, if you, again, as you said, if you can't put food on your table, if you can't put gas in your car, if you're constantly worried about the basics in life, and the basics really are like, you know, food roof over your head. It's not like, oh, I can't get a new PlayStation. It's, It's really the basics. The evidence is just that, yes, obviously, if you get more money, you will feel happier. Once you, you need to have a living wage to be able to function in society, right? But once you get there, once you're making like a reasonable middle class income and in reasonable middle class income, at least in some studies, one, one study by the Nobel Prize winning economist Danny Kahneman it, back in 2009 suggested that was around $75,000. Once you hit that, getting any more money won't help you. And, and in his data set, what he finds is even if you from $75,000 double or quintuple your income, you're not going to get any corresponding benefit in terms of 
more positive mood, less negative emotions, or less stress. Now, that is absolutely not what we think. I mean, I think we think maybe you know, if you had a billion, you know, if you had Elon Musk, yeah, doubling your income is not going to make you happier. But you know, going from seventy five thousand dollars to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, that would definitely help. But the evidence suggests it just really doesn't. And so. I think we need to, you know, to take this into account in, in important ways, right? It's not that money doesn't buy happiness. If you are truly poor, then yes, getting more money is really going to help you, right? And I think that that means structurally we should be thinking about things like living wages in terms of people's well-being. That matters a lot. But for, you know, at least some of the people listening to this podcast right now, it means that, you know, working more hours, doubling your income, worrying about money, it's just not going to work. It's not going to work in the way we think. And and again, I know that feels really foreign. When I present this stuff to my students, this is the one lecture where I get like this long line of students fighting with me, but like, well, but if, you know, I go from 100000 to $200,000, I could take more vacations and hang out with my family. What about that? And it's like, the evidence just suggests it doesn't work like that. Bad 90s music was right with like more money, more problems. You know what I mean? Like one of my favorite podcast episodes I did was with this guy by the name of Clay Cockrell, who the, who's a wealth psychologist. So he's a mental health professional that works with the 0.0001%. And already that he has a job should tell us that money isn't making us happy. But the struggles he describes are people who like, you know, have $500 million and they feel like the arrival fallacy of like, oh, if only I could make a billion, if only I could hit that, you know, if only I could buy a second yacht or a third home, right? Like all the things that we think with our income level, they just do the same thing, but with more stuff. And they truly believe this stuff's going to make them happy and then they get it and it doesn't make them as happy as they think. And, and one of the things that I think can help that helps drive down the level of happiness amongst people who are are wealthy and they retire. They, they they work their whole lives to save so much money and be able to retire with this nest egg. Is their physical health? I mean, I've just seen people time and time again where they have all this money and their physical health has just gone to, to hell, and they're not able to enjoy what they've worked so hard to achieve. And so what does the data suggest as far as the correlation between how healthy you are physically and your level of happiness? Yeah. I mean, I think it matters a lot. Again, things like exercise and sleep are so critical for mental health. But I think another thing that happens isn't just that, you know, people who are super wealthy destroy their physical health. They also have way less time. You know, oftentimes we're trading money for time. You know, we can work more hours at work or we can like take some vacation. And, and the data suggests that you you want to be wealthy, but not wealthy in terms of money. You want to be wealthy in terms of time. This is what researchers are, are talking about in terms of this phenomenon of time affluence, like the subjective sense that you have a lot of free time. And the evidence suggests that people who are more time affluent are happier. And in fact, the opposite, like people who are time famished, where you're like starving for time, this is most of us these days, that can have a huge hit on our happiness. In fact, research by Ashley Willens, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, shows that if you self-report being time famished, that's as bad a hit on your well-being as if you self-report being unemployed. Right. We know unemployment is like, you know, you're, you're not getting the money that's going to affect your happiness. Actually, just being time poor, it can have the same hit on your happiness. So I think one of the things that we forego when we're going for more money is we, we lose time. But that time might be a key to happiness in a way we don't expect. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that people regret, I guess, right, as they get older, is they wish they had like spent their time more effectively and they didn't work so hard and they were able to, to spend like the longer periods of time with people they cared about and that sort of thing. Um, and kind of along the same lines as the subject of money, as it relates to happiness, like are these tools that, that you talk about, are they somewhat universal? Like meaning like, could you take somebody who is living in a, like a lower income house with maybe like a, like a divorced family, give them the happiness tools we've been talking about and then give the same tools to somebody who like lives in like an upper middle class family, the, the family's all together. And then would they have the same results as far as their levels of happiness if they did the exact same thing? Yeah. I mean, for the types of tips we're talking about, yes. I mean, there's obviously some cultural nuance when it comes to specific things that make you happy. But the stuff we've been listing, you know, taking time for gratitude, engaging in social connection, having some time affluence, all these things, as far as we can tell, are universal. I mean, the one caveat is like, you know, social science isn't awesome, right? Like, it'd be great if we tested every single culture and every single population, every single income level. You know, often these studies are skewed towards the populations you might expect, which are like the people who hang out near universities and, you know, are Western educated and, you know, rich, at least relative to the rest of the people in the world. But in cases where these things have been studied in like really broad populations, often what you find is they work 
kind of universally. So this is one of the reasons I focus on these tips in particular is like, no matter who's listening to this podcast right now, all those things that I just listed will probably help and improve your happiness if you engage with them, especially if they're the kind of thing that you're not regularly and intentionally prioritizing in your life normally right now. Got it. Well, yeah, I think so. I think if somebody's listening to this and they're saying like, well, it's easy to do if you live in an environment where people are making more money or the family's together, like this is hopefully like a, like a little bit of a wake up call saying, yeah, I mean, they might be different, but there's still some things you can do to improve your own level of happiness. And this has been awesome. Like I, I could talk to you for days and days about this because I think it's something that is often misunderstood. And it's also something that's incredibly important for people is this complex emotion of happiness. And so with that said, I really wanted to thank you for your time. But before I let you go, I want you to let the audience know, like if they want to check out your upcoming mini series, if they want to listen to your podcast, if they want to find out more about you, like where's the best place to do all that? Yeah, well, we really encourage folks to check out my podcast, The Happiness Lab, which you can download wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be doing this cool new season on our listener questions. So it's like probably exactly the happiness questions that you have on your mind as a listener to this podcast. That's what we're going to be covering. And if you really want to learn more about the science of happiness, we actually have a free version of the class that I teach at Yale on Coursera.org. It's called The Science of Wellbeing. And so, you know, you can take the same class that the Yaleys take for free. So I encourage you to check out both of those things if you want to learn more. Amazing. Well, Lori, this has been awesome. I will make sure to plug all that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that she said at the beginning of our conversation when it comes to like what the keys to happiness are, like what is missing from people's lives when they're miserable. Maybe it was something that she just said about how a lot of the, the stuff we've talked about is universal. Maybe it was something that she said about money, which we all know that money can't buy happiness and that, but we do have to have a certain level of money to be able to provide like food and shelter and the basic needs of our own life to have like a baseline level of happiness, whatever it was, tag Laurie, tag my myself and because we'd love to hear your feedback and we once again thank you for listening to this episode of the adversity advantage i'm your host doug bobst and we'll see you next time